Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ted Hodgkinson, Head of Literature and Spoken Word at the South Bank Centre, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Queen Elizabeth Hall for this very special event in partnership with Intelligence Squared. Tonight's debate poses a burning question which is rarely out of the news and indeed has become a pivotal point of tension in our cultural life. Is climate activism working is also a question at the heart of our wider planet summer season at South Bank Centre, inspired by our pioneering Dear Earth exhibition and featuring speakers including Greta Thunberg, Vanessa Nakate, Richard Curtis and Mark Carney. We're honoured that tonight's debate will be opened with a reading by the Booker Prize winning author and poet Sir Ben Ockery, who has been knighted for services to literature and who is committed to, draw, to using his platform to draw attention to climate change and celebrating the power of the written and spoken word. In a moment, Ben will read a poem and sections from his latest work, Tiger Work, Poems, Stories and Essays about Climate Change. Following on from this, Ben will be joined on the stage by Phoebe Plummer, Dr. Rupert Reed, Tom Harwood, and the chair of the debate, Rita Lashar, who will introduce the panel in more detail. There will be time towards the end of the debate for audience questions, and if you'd like to ask something, please raise your hand, and if selected by Rittler, one of my South Bank Centre colleagues will come to you with a microphone. As part of our ongoing commitment to making our Talks and Literature programme accessible, this event is being live captioned by Claire Hill, and British Sign Language is provided by Amelie Davy and Sharon Thind. Copy, uh, copies of Ben Ockrey and Dr. Rupert Reed's books are available from our book selling partners at Foyles in the foyer immediately outside the auditorium. My thanks to our partners at Intelligence Squared for all their work on tonight's event, in particular to Connor Boyle, and to my colleagues at South Bank Centre, not least Rebecca Millward, for managing the event tonight. Please welcome to the stage Ben Ockrey. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, first thing I want to say is that the South Bank Center's Planet Summer Season presents a series of events that offer empowering insights on how we can all make a difference. Because collective change is only possible when we believe it on an individual level. So please, support these events, and spread the spirit. I'm going to read to you from a, a poem called Broken, from Tiger Work, which is a suite of poems, essays, stories, interviews, letters, cubistically around the subject of climate change. The Broken. When they asked me to come up with words that could speak to a world on the verge of environmental collapse, I had a crisis of my own. Fever runs in the veins. The seasons run on broken groves. The facts are horrific. The evidence overwhelming. And still we carry on as if no crisis were looming. Thunder hovers above our roofs. Earth shakes beneath our floors. What can one say to those who either don't want to hear or have heard enough? What can one say that doesn't paralyze some with the sheer scale of the problem? In the end, I wrote a poem of just two lines, composed of 12 words. The words were fully synthesized on grass grown on Hessian and floated on the Brown River. Can't you hear the future weeping? Our love must change the world. Good Thames, glide gently while I sing this song. Good Thames, we know not for the earth how long. Two, this earth that we love is in grave danger because of us. We have raped, exploited, abused, wrecked, disemboweled, and destroyed her. We blow her up, we blast her apart, we smash her, we detonate atomic bombs on her, we poison her. 
The oceans are acidic. The rising mouths of the sea will devour men on their lunch breaks, women at their desks, children wandering home from school. We have thrown at people distressing facts, numbers, temperatures, loss of species. Will undersea hydrates collapse? Will the bat and the rhino survive? Will the tiger and the butterfly breathe the same air? Will the fortunes of the songbird revive? Facts don't alter our dreams or change our minds. Fear doesn't work, and guilt doesn't work. So I thought that maybe love could shift our vision, shift our dreams, shift our breath. Maybe if we all do something modest, then the dead land can yield roses again and desert be fertilized with marigolds. Perhaps we've grown too complicated for our own good. We want our fruits to ripen without much time. I think that love is the highest economy of life. It moves the world with an invisible touch. In the Tao Te Ching, there is a light crammed passage which says that the sage loves the world as they love their body. If the earth were our body, would we do half the things to it that we're doing? Take a nuclear blast to the kidney, smash the heart with metal spikes, frack the intestines, mine the brain with explosive rain? Nothing can save our world but love. Toughness will fail. Even the nail succumbs to rust. What we need now, in this 11th hour, when the bell tolls from the sinister tower, is the greatness of the human. This is a time to show that we are greater than our history, our education, greater than all the brainwashing that makes us feel that we can be agents of change. So I went out into the streets today and marched with millions to light a way. So I said to the armies, return to the hearth. Even a child can change the day, even you can make a new way. Do you love this world? Seas, valleys, trees, destinies, coral reefs. Do you love this earth? Faces, bodies, dreams, hollies. Then all you have to do is listen to your love. But the love I'm talking about is not passive. Doesn't sleep when the baby cries on the hot bed. Doesn't stare with placid eyes when a lion crouches near. It is a love that stop something awful happening to the one you love. It is protective. I went out into the dark today and fought to stop the forest from falling away. I raised the alarm at the fires in the farm. Let's turn the fierce force of our love to saving life on this planet. March and sing and do the tough thing demand climate justice, that those, who, that those who cause the greater damage bear the greater cost. Should the tortoise bear the same weight as the elephant? Save the earth one step at a time. We have got to do something rare, a quantum leap in our possibilities, from devouring the earth to making a world, from waste to conservation, from pollution 
to transmutation. Everything we need is here. Sun, sea, earth, wind, imagination, will, vision, love, mind. We need to leap right now to the next stage of our evolution. Maybe this was the only way we were going to get there, through the dead end and the climate terminus, the follies in the garden. Maybe we're only forced to make this leap because we've nowhere else to go. We've run out of road. And instead of tipping over into our own abyss, we do the unthinkable and leap to the next stage of the human in the dying minutes of our millennial drama. Without this leap, there is no future. Can't you hear the future weeping? Our love must save the world. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Intelligence Squared and South Bank Centre debate. I'm Rithula Shah. Thank you very much to Ben Okri for that wonderful poem. Tonight's debate couldn't really be more timely. In recent weeks, we've seen record temperatures across the world, with Tuesday, July the 4th, I think the hottest day ever recorded globally. We've also seen climate activists disrupt Wimbledon, throw orange confetti at George Osborne's wedding, and continue these sort of tactics that uh, they believe are the only way to make people sit up and listen about the impact of climate change. Their detractors, though, would say these actions are selfish, counterproductive, and even outright dangerous. On the other hand, if it's true that there's no such thing as bad publicity, the protesters should be very pleased. Not a day seems to go by without a group, and in most recently it's been Just Stop Oil, making headlines of some sort. For instance, on Monday, the Times front page declared, judges urged to get tough with Just Stop Oil protesters. Or how about Lewis Hamilton backs peaceful Just Stop Oil protest at British Grand Prix? I think that was The Guardian. And what about public opinion? Well, it seems that context matters. A poll, poll conducted by Omnisys last year found 66% of people in the UK support taking non-violent direct action to protect the country's nature. But another recent YouGov poll found that six in 10 Brits think the defacing of art or public monuments should be made a specific criminal offense. Who's right? Well, we've got four speakers with us tonight to try and help us better understand these issues. Phoebe Plummer, next to me here, is a Just Stop Oil activist who famously threw soup at Van Gogh's sunflowers at the National Gallery. Phoebe believes radical activism is necessary to shift attitudes towards climate change. On my far right, Tom Harwood is a journalist and commentator. He's deputy political editor of GB News and has extensively covered uh, climate protests and government policy on energy and climate change. Ben Okri, you've already met, a poet and novelist who's very interested in the connection between art and climate activism. He's won many awards throughout his career, including the Booker Prize for Fiction for the novel The Famished Road. His new book is Tiger Work, which is a personal appeal for action on the climate crisis. And Dr. Rupert Reed is a former Extinction Rebellion spokesperson and associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia. He's the co-director of the Climate Majority Project and author of Why Climate Breakdown Matters. Welcome to you all. We're going to begin by asking each of you on the panel to speak for three minutes on the question of is climate activism working? And then we'll move into the discussion. And I will point out there will be time for questions, so keep them ready. And if you're watching online, then do put them in the Q&A box on the screen. So let's begin with these statements. Phoebe, if you go first. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Phoebe. I'm 21, and I'm a supporter of Just Stop Oil. Many of you will know by now that Just Stop Oil has one clear 
common sense and life-saving demand, and that is that the UK government immediately halts all future licensing and consents for the exploration, development and production of fossil fuels in the UK. It's not just the, the tree huggers who are calling for this, but this demand is echoed by the United Nations, the International Energy Agency, that's a world leading authority on energy, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that's the most comprehensive global report on the climate crisis. So I hope that it's not going to be up for debate tonight that we need to take action on the climate crisis. I also hope it's not going to be up for debate the advice of all of these internationally respected scientific and political bodies. I have to admit, I, uh, I take a little bit of an issue with, our, with the whole framing of the debate. I don't think we should be asking the question, is climate activism working? I think we all need to be talking about why there is such an urgent need for action on the climate crisis. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the catastrophic predictions that scientists make about the future we're heading towards if we continue burning fossil fuels. But I'd, I'd like to mention one, and that's because when I heard this, it was, it was a killer fact that made me realize I had to take action beyond the lifestyle changes that I've been making before and the petition signing and letter writing. And uh, this prediction comes from a paper which was published in Nature Sustainability, which is a highly respected, peer-reviewed scientific journal. And it predicts that by 2030, before I'm 30 years old, we will see one billion climate refugees. One billion. Now those one billion climate refugees they're not a number, they're not a statistic. That is 1,000 million names and faces. That is 1,000 million people with loved ones and lives, lives that are not worth any less than ours because we live somewhere that's economically developed and won't be hit by the worst effects of the climate crisis first. That's millions of families losing their homes and their safety. That's millions of children without access to food or drinking water. That is death and suffering on a scale I can't even begin to comprehend. And that's not something that I'm about to sit by and let happen. By pushing ahead with over 100 new fossil fuel licenses, the government is knowingly taking a course of action that will kill countless millions. There's nobody that's coming to save us. That's why ordinary people are stepping up and taking extraordinary action on the climate crisis. And that's why we need more normal people stepping up into action. Thank you, Phoebe. Tom Harwood. I think I'd like to inject some numbers into what we're talking about. Because often in this conversation, what we hear is that nothing is being done. What we hear is that there is this crisis unfurling and nobody cares, nobody is moving. But since 1990, the United Kingdom has decreased the amount of CO2 we emit into the atmosphere from 602 million tonnes down to 347 million tonnes. That's about halving. That's, that's a reduction of 42%. That's more than any country in the G7 has done. That's more than any country in the G20 has done. It's frankly an impressive amount. And what's more interesting is that since 2010 is when the majority of that decarbonisation has occurred. 65% of that decrease has come 
just since 2010, mainly through squeezing coal out of our energy production, but also through diversification, the enormous amount of offshore wind capacity this country now has. These are material things that have occurred in the last 30 years. And to add to that, the group Just Stop Oil formed in 2022. Before Just Stop Oil threw a single can of soup at a single painting or lay in a single road, the United Kingdom had legally committed itself to net zero by 2050. Before Just Stop Oil formed, the United Kingdom legislated to ban new diesel and uh, petrol cars by the end of this decade. Before Just Stop Oil formed, the United Kingdom legislated to ban gas boilers in new homes by 2025. And indeed, hosted a global climate conference where 90% of the world signed up to net zero by 2050, and 85% of the world's forests represented by their leaders committed to reverse deforestation and land degradation by the end of this decade. Now, these are huge material things that are happening. These are legally binding commitments that governments have made. And these are enormous reductions in the amount of CO2, particularly the United Kingdom, has been emitting, all before anyone lay in any road or threw anything at any work of art. Now, what has happened since 2022? Well, the Public Order Act. Uh, has anything else materially changed? Well, perhaps. Uh, perhaps it's not even moving along at the status quo, perhaps what Just Stop Oil risks doing, and groups like it, are polarising a debate that in this country has not been polarised. Could it be that the 72% of Brits who currently agree with net zero by 2050 could be split, degraded and partitioned by more extreme political action? Could it be that people start to question the need for net zero more than they currently do because this politicises a debate that currently holds consensus in this country in a way that it does not hold consensus in, for example, the United States of America? A poll was done just the other week by the group More in Common, and they looked to create consensus in society. They were founded, actually, after the, uh, after the death of Joe Cox. And they found that every single voter type in the United Kingdom supports net zero by a majority. The lowest was 54% of what they call disengaged traditionalists. Now, might it be that those numbers start to tick down if people associate climate action and people associate these sort of causes with radical political activism and indeed the sort of activism that most polls are now showing turns people off, makes people groan? Might that be a worry? Might that actually be counterproductive? Thank you very much, Tom. Ben? I thought he should speak next. I've just read a big poem. <laughs> All right, then. I, I should catch my breath. Rupert. Thank you. Um, what's the old phrase? Lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, the actual fact is that Britain has barely reduced its carbon emissions at all when you count properly. In other <laughs> words, it, it, well, this, let me explain. Let me explain to you. <laughs> when you count properly, when you include, most importantly, the vast amount of carbon emissions that since 1990 we have offshored to countries like China and India, when you count properly, then the amount of reduction is less than 10%. And that is an abject fail. So, like Phoebe, I'd like to challenge the framing of the question here this evening a little bit. Um, it seems to me it'd be much more interesting to debate a question like, uh, is this civilization working? Or is our system working? Or in the context of climate, is Britain working? But actually, maybe it wouldn't be more interesting, because the answer to those questions on balance, it's all pretty obvious in relation to everyone, the answer is no. <laughs> so we've been given a different question, is climate activism working? E even that question, taken on its own terms, I'd like to reframe because I think there's a danger that when we focus on activism, we focus on something which is actually marginal to most people. Most people are not activists and are never going to be activists. 
So I've got a question for you, the audience here this evening. Is this the kind of person I'm about to describe? Is this you? Is this you? Are you afraid, are you concerned that the situation is worse, perhaps much worse, than our leaders and our media are encouraging us to believe? Are you someone who is well aware that just recycling and giving five pounds a month to Friends of the Earth is hopelessly inadequate? But you're not someone who is inclined to want to glue themselves to anything. Are you someone who is desirous of taking part in action which actually is going to be effective in changing things? Well, if you are, if you can answer yes to those questions, then you're probably part of the climate majority. What we believe in the Climate Majority Project is that there is a silent, moderate majority in this country which is yearning to know what to do to put right the terrible wrongs that our government and our civilization are currently engaged in. And we are seeking to start to offer some path towards putting that right, which go way beyond the frame of activism, that step way outside that bubble. So for, for instance, we are encouraging people to take part in what we call community climate action, which is involving the whole community in efforts to build resilience, grow food, demonstrate adaptation to the new climate, the new climatic regime that we are starting to experience. Because the great thing about that kind of activity of building preparedness is that firstly, it helps you to be in a position to survive what's coming better. And secondly, it helps wake everyone else up. When people see people engaging in adaptation to our deteriorating climate, they think, oh my God, it's real. It's, it's not about 2100 or 2050. It's here, it's now, it's 40 degrees last summer, etc., etc. And it's things like activism or action, much more widely than just activism, in workplaces, in professions, in businesses. It's lawyers, for example, litigating, and lawyers in corporations saying to their companies, you need to change what you're doing to comply with the laws as they are now and the laws that may be coming. Uh, it's, it's lawyers stepping into their full power, and the same could apply to auditors and insurers and many, many more. So these are the kinds of things, these are the kinds of ways we think it's possible for the majority to step up into their full power. And you know what? Until that happens, we're never going to win on this, which means we're not going to have a future, because there is no way we get to get to where we need to on this without the majority of this country on side. Thank you. Ben, would you like a few more words? You don't have to have them. Well, I think I finally caught my breath. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm relieved uh, at uh, two things uh, with this panel. At least there isn't uh, any sort of absolute uh, denial um, going on. So we can actually begin from a, uh, a base of understanding that there is uh, a, a global and a local climate crisis. I'd like to, I would like to actually address the question uh, because it fascinates me. Because they ask the question all the time uh, that there are issues uh, that have to deal with change. They ask the same question with the suffragettes when they attach themselves to railings and threw themselves in front of horses. Is this, is this action uh, actually going to help your cause? Is it not going to turn people off? Is it not going to uh, make the government put laws out there that will restrain any kind of thing that you can do to further your cause. In fact, isn't it, uh, as a matter of fact, counterproductive? They said the same thing in South Africa during apartheid. They said the same thing uh, in, in, in America with, 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 uh, with the freedom votes, with Martin Luther King and, and the marches. They said the same thing in India. Uh, the marches for independence. Whenever there are big issues of justice and people are saying, there has to be change. They always say the same thing. These actions you're taking, will it harm your cause? Will it actually turn people against you? So on and so forth. And the questions appear to be very legitimate and very reasonable. But fundamentally, we're dealing with human rights. We're dealing with big issues of change that kind of go beyond the politeness of those questions. And right now, with this issue, we're dealing, I think, with the biggest crisis 
that has faced the human race. I think this is the, this is the most important issue, not of a generation, but of the human history. And it affects not just human beings, but the species of this earth. It's very big. It's the biggest thing we've had to deal with. So I think that the level of the questions being asked of those who are trying to draw attention to it is unfortunately rather pathetically small. It just in relation to the size of the issue. I think we need bigger questions than whether this helps your cause or not. I think we need bigger questions than whether it is going to be counterproductive. Counterproductive uh, against what? Against the fact that the, the, the globe has to turn this, we have to turn this ship heading towards disaster, we have to turn it round, and we don't have enough time, there's not enough space to get there, that we need a, an acceleration in global awareness, we need, to, we need to feel this issue, it personally, as well as on a governmental and corporational level. Um, I think we need a bigger question. I don't think it's a question of whether climate activism is working because climate activism has to exist and it will evolve like all struggles, all legitimate struggles that's trying to help the human race. They all evolve, they begin crudely by, you know, Nelson Mandela began apparently as, 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 as a terrorist and he evolved into something much higher and, 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 and finer while still carrying out resistance. Climate activism is evolving and has to evolve because you're dealing with the you're dealing with powers, you're dealing with lawmakers, you're dealing with people who are uncomfortable with with this kind of activist, activism, who can make laws to restrict the kind of activism. We know that because protest has been restricted. You're dealing with power on the one hand, and you're dealing with the public on the other hand, which feels this issue but has a combination of apathy and uh, a sense of being overwhelmed by the issue at the same time. So between activating the vast populace because nothing is going to change without the people, without everybody pitching in, as it were, feeling this and making it personal and acting and voting accordingly. Nothing is going to change till all of us feel this as a personal passion. So the thing is, activism, I think, has to do what it has to do to catch our imagination, to annoy us, to irritate us, to keep the issue constantly in our mind, and above all, to saturate the atmosphere so that this issue is completely unavoidable. For one very simple reason. We not only need to solve the climate crisis that's hanging over us, we need to get the human race to a place where we never have this kind of issue again. We shouldn't be having this. We need to get to a place where we are not only sustainable, but imaginative and beautiful uh, and friendly and interconnected as a human species. That's my pitch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And remember, you can tweet about the event using the hashtag IQ2. And do keep your questions in mind. We will have time for them at the end. And if you're watching online, you can click on the Q&A button under the video screen and then press send. Phoebe, I'm going to begin with you. Ben has very passionately made the case for why activism is so important, why this issue is so big, so vital. But I'm going to be rather more basic and say, actually, are some of the protests that your group in particular has carried out just really irritating? And are you in danger of breaking down the political consensus, the public consensus that perhaps exists around climate change, at least in this country? Um, we, in, in Just Stop Oil, we're using tactics of non-violent civil disobedience because history has proved time and time again that this is the only hope we have left to get the radical change we need in the time scale that we have left. <laughs> we, we get asked this a lot, and I just want to say, pick up a, a history book. Successful movements of social change must cause disruption. You don't even have to pick up a history book. You can look at me, I'm sat here today as living proof that civil resistance works. I'm queer, I'm non-binary, but born female, so the only reason I'm able to vote I have the option of going to university, hopefully someday marrying the person I love, because of those who have taken part in civil resistance before me. Tom, uh, it may be irritating to find yourself stuck on the M25. You may think it's a bit pointless, perhaps, to chuck soup at a painting. But A, this is keeping this issue in the headlines, and B, 
This is a universal issue, as Ben was describing. It's about much more than whether people in the UK are a bit irritated. Oh, certainly. It's about much more than the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom amounts for less than 1% of global CO2 emissions. If we want to be really helping things, we need to be talking about the sorts of innovations that perhaps the United Kingdom could help generate to help the developing world bring down its emissions, particularly to help the United States and China bring down their emissions. Or we could look closer to home. We could look to Germany, which for some reason, unbeknownst to any reasonable scientist, has decided to close down its nuclear power stations thanks to the Greens joining government. Now, if they turned those things back on, their CO2 emissions would stop going up and start going down again. That's the sort of thing that we could be doing internationally to help this situation because it is absolutely a global issue. It's not a parochial issue and sometimes I think this discussion can be too parochial. But I do also think that there is something uh, much more profound about the nature of the coalition that exists at the moment that is often ignored. I was so interested to hear that at least there isn't someone denying climate change on this panel. Who in public life denies climate change? No, this is not America. People. This, this is not America. And do you know what? It's so interesting to hear Just Stop Oil, I think it was on, on Good Morning Britain just a couple of days ago, saying that George Osborne was a climate change denier. George Osborne. Now, he's the guy that put green taxes on energy bills. He's the guy that co-founded okay. husky-hugging conservatism. He's the guy that helped establish the Powering Past Coal Alliance. If we're going to call him a climate denier, who the hell isn't? Rupert, it's a big issue. Are we dealing with it in a way that really reflects that universality? Well, look, yeah, Britain is a small country. But, you know, I really hate it when um, people from GB News do our country down. Uh, we can actually be world leaders here, right? Tom's going on about how insignificant we are, poor little Britain. We can be world leaders by, for example, firstly recognizing our vast historical responsibility. We're the ones who started all the trouble uh, with the Industrial Revolution uh, and, and the way that, that's unfolded. Secondly, by recognizing that the city of London uh, may be a small place, but 15% of all fossil fuel capital passes through the city of London. Oh yeah, we punch well above our weight, just in the wrong bloody direction. Uh, and thirdly, by recognizing that we have been world leaders in relation to social movements in the way that Phoebe was sketching, and most lately in relation to climate movements. So Tom mentioned earlier the, the fact that before Just Stop Oil were formed, uh, we in this country passed the uh, Climate Change Act, the first, uh, sorry, the, the, the Zero Carbon uh, by 2050. Uh, act under Theresa May's government, the first uh, country in the world uh, to do that. Yes, it was before Just Stop Oil. It was after Extinction Rebellion, and I think it's almost certain that it wouldn't have happened without Extinction Rebellion's intervention in 2019. So yes, we can punch well above our weight and let nobody from GB News tell you that Britain is just a little country that should be pitied. Since I was directly referenced, yes. um, I, th I think if you actually listen to what I said, is what the, UK very could do, what the UK could do. We've got some of the best universities in the world. Why aren't we doing more to establish carbon capture schemes that work? Why aren't we doing more to keep bringing down the cost of photovoltaic cells? Why aren't we doing more to generate the sort of improvements that can really genuinely improve the lives particularly Well, you tell me, why aren't we? Perhaps it's got something to do with the fact that we've had a terrible government which has gone worse and worse over the last 13 years in these regards. Tom, if, if those things are to happen, is climate activism going to get in the way or is it going to keep that issue, the issue, at the top of the political agenda and perhaps bring pressure on politicians who may well be more worried about inflation and their electoral prospects? More, more parliamentary time as a result of Just Stop Oil has been spent on banning noisy protest than has been spent on talking about climate change. That is a direct response to the sort of activism that is promoted by Just Stop Oil. And I take, action, I take issue with the fact that um, you're describing it as, 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 as non-violent. I'm not sure vandalism is always non-violent. If you're destroying someone's property, to me, that's a violent act. But, it's, a, it, but it's, a, it's immaterial, because what it does is it irritates people, it divides a previously established coalition, and it makes your aims and objectives less likely to be achieved. Phoebe, the total cost of police just stop oil protests in May this year stood at more than 14.5, I think I've written down billion, but I think I mean million pounds. 
asked that question. It's a, well, the question is picking up from what Tom said. Uh, is this a distraction when actually parliamentary time, police time, public funds could be spent more constructively? Well, if uh, the government would like to spend less money policing Just Stop Oil's protests, I suggest that they do the common sense thing, listen to the advice and warnings of their very own scientists, and put an end to all new oil, gas and coal licences. Just Stop Oil's disruption will end the moment that the government make that statement. Tom? <laughs> The basic aim of, of Just Stop Oil is very clear. Yeah. It's something that's been discussed. In fact, Labour has rode back from, from a, com a similar commitment. Mm. Why do you think there hasn't been a bigger debate around this issue? Well, isn't it interesting, the Labour Party's position on this? The, the way that they've been sort of rowing backwards and forwards and backwards again in response to public opinion. It almost to me seems that the more that Just Stop Oil sort of disrupt Wimbledon or things that might upset Middle England, the more the Labour Party rows back from previous commitments it made on climate change. So perhaps that is a brilliant example of the counterproductive nature of these protests. And also, I think we should rely upon the words of Sir Keir Starmer, the guy that's 20 points ahead in the polls, the guy that's most likely to be the next prime minister, someone that we should probably listen to if we want to listen to the next five years of government policy, at least. Uh, he was calling the disruption from Just Stop Oil uh, not just annoying, but arrogant. Arrogant as if these people are the only people who understand the issues. Arrogant as if we can hold the government to uh, we can hold the we can hold the government to ransom mm. on issues of policy. What if people who disagree with you also took the same response? What if people, for example, the small minority in this country who believe that abortion is murder, started lying in the roads and throwing paint at things until the government changed their policy on that? Would that be right? Of course Rupert, not. We live in a democratic Rupert, society Rupert, and we don't do politics by violence. Rupert, I, I'm going to bring you in. You can answer as much of that as you want, but just to pick up on one particular mm. point. There is a bit of a stereotype, isn't there, that blocking roads is something that's done by sort of middle-class people who can afford to protest while it's actually working people who suffer. Yeah, so look, what we found ourselves doing in the last 10 minutes is what often happens on these occasions is that we're, we're, we're talking about activism and we're talking especially about Just Stop Oil. Uh, and what I was trying to make clear in my opening remarks is that there is a hazard to spending all this time focusing on tactics rather than the substance. Uh, and but the tactics are what are, are what are affecting us all, and presumably people like Phoebe are taking on those tactics because they believe they will be effective. And I guess what we're yeah. trying to get at is how effective are they? Well, indeed. And the, the truth is that we, we're not going to know for a long time. Uh, as uh, Chu Enlai famously said, it's much too soon to say. Uh, history will judge one way or another if we're fortunate enough to have history books written uh, of, this, uh, of this period. What is obvious is that uh, when history, if history judges, Just Stop Oil will be seen to be on the side of the angels. And what is obvious is that their central demand of no new oil is entirely correct. The question of effectiveness, we can't really judge. But what we are suggesting in the Climate Majority Project very strongly is that what is now necessary is for there to be a lot more happening, which is not, not just Just Stop Oil, a relatively small organization, attracting a very large amount of attention. So for example, one of the points I would make to people in this room is, if you are thinking, how shall I spend my time if I'm convinced, yeah, I need to get more involved in action on climate, what should I actually do? What is likely to be effective? I would say to you, Just Stop Oil are being very effective at attracting attention, and that will have some good effects and maybe some bad effects as well. What we actually need now is huge numbers more of people engaging in the kind of things I was sketching so, earlier, so action in workplaces, action in communities. Just to, just, just, just to finish the point, because, because, and this is crucial, for every thousand people doing the kind of thing that we are trying to convene in the Climate Majority Project, you know, one or two people in Just Stop Oil can potentially attract the same amount of attention. So, so it is crucial that there needs to be a huge new wave which is much broader and which is action rather than just activism. You stepped away from Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. The title of the discussion today, whether we like it or not, is, is climate activism working. Does that suggest, from what you've just said, that you actually don't agree with the tactics employed by Just Stop Oil, or at least you, you're not convinced of their effectiveness? What I came to believe, and, and many others in XR have come to believe this, and this is part of the reason why XR now has a more moderate strategy, uh, is that the raising of the alarm in 2019 
was very effective, resulting, for example, in the, the first uh, Zero Carbon uh, Act, uh, and that it was crucial now to have a lot more people mobilizing the moderate majority, the silent majority, the climate majority, to start doing the stuff on the ground and ultimately changing the political culture such that the government that gets in will be a lot better than a Kia Star gov Starmer government is going to be, because Starmer has already said we're not going to uh, uh, ban no new oil. If we're going to get that kind of massive political culture shift, it's going to require millions of people so to step up in their lives. So you're not convinced the effectiveness of extinction, uh, just stop oil? Oh, I'm convinced that if we don't have a, a, a mass stepping up by the climate majority, okay. we're not going to get where we need to get to. Do you know who was actually responsible for the net zero by 2050 um, pledge, the, 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 the legal commitment that Theresa May made uh, in her last days in office. Um, this is going to sound quite funny, but it was Nigel Farage. Mm. Do you know why? Do you know why? Theresa May wanted something for her legacy. She'd been forced out of office. She'd lost the European elections. She came fifth in them. She, she lost the local but why elections. Why did she decide on that right? for her legacy? She decided on that she for her legacy. She was grabbing something that was she long term. On that for her legacy. Political because, expediency. Because, because, don't think right, it's something let's, higher. Let's not, let's because not XR about had made it salient. Everybody right. who understands the situation knows that. Everyone in let's XR keep looking forward. That. Let's keep looking forward. Ben, you've spoken very passionately about why you think that activism is really important. You've spoken passionately about how you uh, feel that this is the issue of our day. It's the issue facing the human race what do you think why do you believe that artists can be heard more clearly than perhaps scientists or protesters have been until now i think we need a concert of voices i think we need an orchestra a huge vast million scale billion scale orchestra of voices uh, we need voices of different registers we need we need we need the timpani we need those instruments that are annoying when you hear them by themselves, but when they're part of a whole big orchestra, they add to the beauty and the power of, of, of the show that's going on. We need different kinds of voices. We need angry voices, we need reasonable voices, we need polite voices, we need letters to the editor, we need letters to parliament, we need people doing a little bit, we need my daughter sort of taking a stick and taking plastic out of the, out of the canal. We need a vast array of voices, but the most important thing is we need voices. And uh, I, I, want to, I want to leave with an image. Uh, your friend's house is burning. You can see it burning. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Fire, everything. He's, he or she is, is in there uh, uh, asleep. Uh, what do you do to, to, to draw the attention to it? House is burning. Friend of yours. What do you do to draw, draw attention? Do you, do you take a little paper a paper aeroplane and, and throw it to the, through the window with a little sign saying, you need to wake up, your house is burning. No, you do whatever you can to get their attention. Meanwhile, everybody out here is doing whatever they can to put the fire out. That's the situation we're in. We do whatever we can to draw attention to it. We do whatever we can to transfigure the situation so that we have a beautiful human race on a great planet. Phoebe, agreement then from, from Ben and Rupert that you need to get many people into this conversation, and I, I'm sure you wouldn't disagree with that. But do you think radicalism is the way to wake up the mainstream? Is, is, are you in danger of alienating as many people as you wake up? Can I just clarify something before you keep yeah. parroting on about net zero by 2050? That uh, last summer, the government were found guilty of not meeting those legally binding net zero agreements, which already weren't good enough. Um, and we keep on coming back to this, the tactics and the effectiveness of tactics. Um, I find it hilarious because any tactics would be more effective if we stopped having this farcical debate about tactics and started holding the government to account for the decisions that they are making. They are pushing ahead with these fossil fuel licensings, knowing the consequences that that is going to have. They know that it is actively planning the deaths of millions of people. It is going to displace people in low-lying uh, island states. It's already causing crop failure and food shortages. We're going to see famine the world over. Already people are losing their homes in wildfires and floods. Continuing to take this course of action 
is an act of genocide, and people are not holding the government to account for that. That's crass. What? To, to, to evoke genocide is, is deeply crass, but we'll move, we'll move on. I do, I do want to ask... It's going to be a, a self-genocide of the entire human race if we're not me. careful. I do want to ask a question. Goodness me, you, I mean, you don't know the climate scientists that I know, self Okay, okay, um, do, you, do you support new nuclear people. power stations? I do not support new nuclear okay, power Okay, do you support new nuclear... No, let, let me just ask... Let me ask... Now let me ask... Explain to you no, I'm Tom. just on, simply okay, saying... Tom, Tom, let, you have had a long let's, time let's, to speak. You, you have had a long time to speak. Can I explain myself and then you can explain yourself? Is that okay? All right, very good. Go for it. Knock yourself out. Right. We're talking about specific things that can help bring down CO2 emissions, aren't we? No. We're talking about holding the government's feet to the fire, holding the government to account. This is something that I did recently on Question Time. The um, government energy minister was there. Indeed, the Labour shadow business spokesman was there, an SNP spokesperson as well. I, I, I explained to them that we haven't built a single new nuclear power station in this country since before I was born. And I explained to them that nuclear power is necessary for net zero. And yet, time and time again, climate activists who profess to care about CO2 reduction will oppose the very means of getting that CO2 reduction. Yeah, why the Green Party is opposing are? solar power farms across this country. The SNP has legislated to ban new nuclear power in Scotland. All of those who profess to care about reducing CO2 use their activism okay. to stop the means of reducing it. Rupert Reed, there's plenty, plenty of people who would argue that nuclear power stations are a very good way to reduce carbon emissions. Mm. Briefly, why do you oppose them? So I think that the reliance on nuclear is mistaken in the following dramatic ways. First, why don't you listen before you shake your head? Because I'm right. Like, oh, Tom, come on, let, we, we let you, you speak, Rupert. Can you answer and then we'll move I'm on. going to answer. So three reasons. Firstly, nuclear power, nuclear power is the most expensive form of power that there is. It's completely uneconomic now compared to solar and wind. Secondly, uh, nuclear power is when you add up the full long-term carbon emissions across the lifetime, including all the amount of time you have to spend looking after the waste indefinitely into the future, it's not clear that there actually is a carbon gain. Thirdly, and most crucially of all, Tragically, we are now in the situation where we cannot guarantee the stability, future stability of our civilization. We may well have to endure some form of civilizational collapse. Now, if that occurs, do you really want there to be fresh working nuclear power stations that are up and running, okay. that could go into meltdown? I'm I say that that is a completely absurd and disastrous thing I to do. I want to get to two more points before we come to questions from Total the unscientific nonsense. Phoebe. Rubbish. I work okay, with these people. Okay, single exactly. nuclear scientist disagrees with you. say, we're moving on. Phoebe, um, we, we talk, you, you portrayed this picture of the potential outcomes of the effects of climate change. But there are many people who would argue that actually it's fossil fuels that have allowed us to have, to enjoy the prosperity that we've enjoyed for the last two or 300 years and to live the lives that we live. Do you think, it's one thing to talk about the calamity of climate change, but do you think there's enough honesty about the kind of changes, the kind of compromises we will need to make to our lives if we are to tackle climate change in the way, with the urgency you describe? I don't think there is enough public discussion about the truth of the climate crisis in general. We're, uh... But if you said to people what this means is you can't drive, you can't buy lots of new clothes, you can't go on you know, any foreign holidays or perhaps you know, the sort of things that people take for granted in a country as rich as this one, how do you think they would receive that? Just Stop Oil hasn't said any of those things. We have but one isn't that the reality? clear common sense demand. And I think it's, it's you know, <laughs> we talk about arrogance. I think it's incredibly arrogant to, to say that you know better than the world's leading climate scientists, than, than the United Nations, the than the International Energy Agency. And I, I know, Tom, that you really, really do care about nuclear. So I do wonder, 
you are aware, aren't you, of the um, government analysis that was published by The Guardian, um, which showed that 12 out of 19 UK civil nuclear sites are at risk of flooding and coastal erosion. Oh, another anti-nuclear activist. Funnily enough, what a surprise. The climate crisis. Now, this is, this is okay, again. Tom, I don't want this to be a conversation about nuclear It's not, it's not going to be, but the we point, have the point it, is, I'm not going to talk about nuclear. Point. I just want, I want to respond to, to that you, in specifics. I want to bring, bring this conversation, we're almost to a close, I want to get in time mm. questions from the audience. But on this point of trade-offs, do you think that actually there is enough honesty about the trade-offs that are needed if we are to meet our net zero target, for instance. Well, not if we're going to campaign against big new forms of energy generation. We heard Rupert earlier talk about the Industrial Revolution as if it was a, as if it was a bad thing. The thing that has massively extended our life expectancy, has cured various diseases. The economic progress that our world has undergone has been the best thing to have happened in the history of mankind. The last 200 years, the fact we now have energy, the fact that we can live in cities and okay. we have MRI but, but machines so and we can live beyond 100 years, that's miraculous. And we can have that. We can continue to have that, but not if we campaign against energy abundance. Okay. The way that we need to decarbonise is through creating so many new forms of clean energy and not campaigning against the interconnectors that we would need to connect to, for example, the French grid, which is nuclear power generated, or to connect to offshore wind farms, which the Green Party is currently campaigning against in Suffolk, or to create solar farms, which again, okay. local campaigners of the Greens, Very the briefly. Tories, the Labour Party, and indeed the, um, just about every single political party is campaigning against the necessary infrastructure to get there. So if, Are you done? And, so finally, I, I want you to stop so finally, because I want if there is something, time If questions. there is something you want to do that is productive in activism... Tom against the world. No, no. Well, it is one versus three. No, you made some very valid points, but it's, we want to get to audience questions. But Rupert, just very briefly, this point about how much honesty is there in this discussion about what is going to be required from ordinary people if we are to meet our mm. zero targets? Uh, mm. It's one thing to protest, it's another thing to talk about the granular detail. Yeah, just briefly on the Industrial Revolution point first, just to explain what I meant. So the point I was making was that it may be too soon to say how good a thing or otherwise the Industrial Revolution was, because, because if we end up destroying the entire human race and the entire planet, we might have to conclude that it wasn't. And that is actually, seems to me, just common sense. Now. It's on the question of, uh, of, of honesty, this is a question very close to my heart and very close to the heart of the Climate Majority Project, because what we passionately believe is that when scientists and leaders and the media level with people about how bad our situation is, that will make it much easier for the Climate Majority to know itself and to manifest itself. And I can tell you it's incredibly bad because I work directly with some of the world's leading climate scientists and what they actually fear and what they actually think is going to happen is worse than what is in the IPCC reports. Over and over again they will tell me this because scientists only put in those reports what they can prove and basically what there is consensus around. What they actually fear and what they actually think is happening is worse than that. So yeah, we need greater, greater honesty across the shop. We need, we need greater truth telling and disclosure. And when we have that, then I think people will be ready to step up and, and change their lives more, just as people did in the Second World War. Ben, I'd like to give you the last word before we come to questions from the audience, which is, how would you describe success? What would it look like in climate action? What would be, what would, you know, if we think about the protests against apartheid, apartheid ended, how would we measure success in climate action? Well, that's a, that's a big one. Um, uh, the, the, the forests in the Amazon, the, would, 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 would they stop cutting down the forests in the Amazon? Um, the Niger Delta in, in Nigeria, uh, which is now uh, being decimated by oil exploration, so that the lands there, vast, vast portions of land, will not be fruitful for hundreds of years, uh, that that be green again. Uh, that we can walk through our cities without choking on, on fumes. That, uh, what, that we can trust our rivers to go swimming without thinking that when you come out of it, you've got stuff clinging to you that you don't want to have any association with. Um, that we, 
that, 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 that our cars, if we have to have cars that we have right now, that our cars are more imaginative in their use of energy. I personally believe, and this is my personal belief, um, that the climate crisis we're facing is one of the biggest signs to the human race that we have outgrown the forms of energy that we use. Um, now, I have a tremendous faith in, in humanity, the intelligence, the creativity, the innovative powers of humanity. I've got great faith in it. And this, this, everything the panel has been saying, even when they're opposed, they give evidence of, of, of the creativity of the human race. I think the sooner we face the facts, the more creative, the more innovative, the more transformative we will be about the kinds of ways we'll get ourselves to that future. Um, they call it a greener future. I call it a simpler future. I think, you know, when you take your child walking down Oxford Street and your child is six years old, your child is at the exact height of the car exhausts. So you are practically gassing your child while you're walking down Oxford Street. Just a simple thought like that ought to make us change. Th rethink our relationship with almost all the technology that we've got and the way in which we use energy. Okay. Well, a passionate conversation here on the stage. I'd like you very much to be part of it. If you're in the hall, there are roving microphones that will come with you. If you put up your hands, I will uh, try and get to as many of you as possible. If you're watching online, please uh, put your question in the, in the chat tab, sorry, I couldn't think of what the phrase was, in the chat tab, and uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, and press send, and I'll try to get to as many of you as possible online and in the hall, and you can also tweet using the hashtag IQ2. Right, here we go, in the hall. Now, there are roving microphones, so make, wait for the microphone to get to you before you start speaking. Okay, there's a lady at the front there, uh, with your hand up, very firmly. I'll take two, how about that? Lady at the front there, and I'll take, there's a lady on this side on the right. So I think there should be a second microphone somewhere. Yeah, okay, so we'll hear from both of you, and then we'll come to the panel. Um, I have a question for the Tom. Um, you've spoken a lot about like the arrogance and how climate activism isn't working, and uh, along all of those other things. Essentially, my question is, you said you believe in the climate crisis. Do you believe that we should have no new oil and gas like the IPCC is saying, like the IEA is saying, and like the UN is saying? Okay, lovely. And um, question on the right. Hi, my name is Jada. I'm from the United States. We got a, quite a few uh, mentions during this panel. <laughs> um, and I was not into you know, climate activism. I didn't know much about climate change. Um, uh, until quite a few years ago when someone walked up to the steps of our Supreme Court and lit himself on fire to bring to people's attention climate change. And I think that is the point of climate activism, that people become aware of it, that people hear about it, that people begin to do their own research, which is something that I did. So my question is, how is climate, or climate activism working? How do organizations here in the UK bring to people's attention that the climate is changing and that they need to begin doing research to assist in uh, making sure that we fix this issue. Thank you very much. Okay, so Tom, the first question very much to you. Do you believe that there should be no new oil and gas exploration? Firstly, can I just plead with everyone in this room, don't set yourselves on fire, please. Do not set yourselves on fire and look at the work of a wonderful, wonderful woman called Hannah Ritchie. She works for Our World in Data and she writes the most wonderful newsletter about the progress that we're making on climate change because she was someone who was young and had no hope and, and was feeling in despair about this. And I think that sometimes the way that people get into this doom loop of despair, it drives them to do crazy things. And that is so very worrying. You always have to have hope. And if you lose hope, then not only do you lose any sort of progress being made to, to CO2 reduction, you also lead to, to horrific stories like the one we just heard. So, so I really do want everyone to make sure that we, we hold some hope there. Um, but on, on, on the question that was directed to me about no new oil and gas, I think everyone 
understands that by 2050, as the uh, IP IPCC uh, ha has said, we, we can't be using oil and gas. The question is the glide path uh, which we use to get to that point. And I don't think anyone would want to live in a world where we immediately stopped using oil and gas tomorrow, where we had to turn off the life support machines in our hospitals or stop scanning for cancer. But it's cancer about exploration or, right. than so, about so, th so this is the question. How quickly can we realistically end the use of oil and gas in the UK? And is it better to take it from the North Sea and perhaps use some form of carbon capture as we extract it? Or is it better to import it from other countries? That, I think, is a matter for debate. So I wouldn't have a... a cast iron position on that issue. Okay, so you're not sure, I think is the answer. Phoebe, I'm going to come to you on that. How is activism working in this country? How would you assess the sort of strength, the progress that's been made by activism here, if you were talking to our friend from the United States? I'd just like to clarify for Tom, and I think everybody does know by now that we are not calling for the taps to be turned off tomorrow on oil, gas and coal. We are asking for no new fossil fuel licences. And, <laughs> and it was in 2021 that the International Energy Agency there could, said there could be no new investments in fossil fuels. It was the Secretary General of the United Nations who said that investing in new fossil fuels is moral and economic madness. We're not calling for the taps to be turned off tomorrow. I think everybody knows that that is ridiculous. We have eight years of oil in reserves, which is more than enough time to make a just transition. Um, <laughs> but to, to come to your point, um, part of, I, I agree, I'm, I'm 21 myself, and I feel like I've grown up most of my life hearing about the climate crisis, um, or rather they would have called it climate change or global warming, and, and these little nuances in, in language and the way it was being spoken about led me to think that it was this far off threat and, and the, the grown-ups in charge had it all under control for me, um, which is a lie, and it was disruptive action like Extinction Rebellions in 2019, which made me do my own research um, and, and listen to what the climate science was saying, which um, was painting a much scarier picture than I was ever aware of growing up. I mean, I learned in my GCSE geography the pros and cons of the climate crisis. We're, we're t still teaching kids this today. I mean, seriously, cons. Crop failure, famine, water shortages, the, the loss of your securities, the breakdown of our society and all we hold dear. Pros, we can make wine in England. Yeah. And, and children, they can play outside in February. You know, this is how we're educated about it. Um, and that's why we need to take this disruptive action because disruption makes the space for discourse, which is not otherwise happening. And, and we have a completely undemocratic media system. I mean, from an economic model, five billionaires control over 80% of, of media in the UK. And um, so when my friend Eddie disrupted the World Snooker Championships, he got more media attention and made more headlines than Extinction Rebellion got at their big one. So one man in two minutes, got more attention and made more headlines than over 90,000 people in the centre of London for four days. An interjection from the chair who spent a long time working in news. Uh, news tends to like hooks, things that happen as opposed to processes that continue for a long time, which is a problem <laughs> that climate change has in its coverage. But anyway, it's a conversation for another time. Question from... Sorry? <laughs> so, but, but can I address this from the perspective of um, the old saw that you mentioned, Richler, of all publicity being good publicity? Because mm. I think it is pretty clear that that old saw is false. So I'm going to give an example which is not from Just Stop Oil, it's from Extinction Rebellion. Uh, the, when, Extinction Rebell when a few marginal Extinction Rebellion activists um, tried to stop public transport running on the underground, in London in October 2019, it was disastrous. And I think there's very few people now who, uh, who deny that. They got loads of publicity and yes. it wasn't good. So you, you do always have to ask, is what you're doing 
likely to have a net positive effect. And you can't always know that, but you can make better and worse decisions. Now, the, the concern that we in the Climate Majority Project have is that it is quite easy for people to make the following kind of slippage in their minds. They think of climate action, they think of climate activism. They think of climate activism, they think of Just Stop Oil. And what we're saying is it's so important that people have other stuff to think about and other stuff to do. Uh, if you like the kind of thing I'm saying about this this evening, do go to climatemajorityproject.com, check out what we're, what we're putting forward there. We need to have huge numbers of people undertaking action that is not identified as being that kind of divisive um, in terms of opinion directly then from what you're saying there's an online question from Sarah uh, who puts to both you and Phoebe instead of changing politicians minds why don't you run for parliament yourself so I have run for parliament uh, myself uh, didn't get elected partly because our system is of course unbelievably insanely undemocratic uh, it relies on huge amounts We've got, we've got first past the post, which is, you know, beyond a joke. Uh, money uh, uh, buys votes to a considerable uh, extent. We have an extremely uh, skewed uh, media landscape, skewed towards the right and against uh, green uh, perspectives. But the really crucial point I would make here is this, that the kind of shift that we're talking about, the kind of shift that we need, the kind of shift in political culture that we need, it needs to shift, if you will, the whole of Parliament in such a way that it takes these kinds of things seriously. And that's why, for example, in the Climate Majority Project, we're very pleased okay. that we've got some Conservatives I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna on board, because there. it needs to be people in every party who are understanding that the whole spectrum needs to shift. I want, I want to get some more qu uh, questions in, but Phoebe, if I can ask you, you're only 21, this is perhaps a little bit unfair, but would you consider standing for Parliament? at some point? Um, <laughs> got one yeah, vote. I, 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 I was yeah. going to say, I'm 21, I've got pink hair, I don't have a degree, I don't think I'm going to get elected. But having said which, our Prime Minister hasn't been elected, so apparently you don't need that to get into power. He has been elected and, as an MP, and we don't have a presidential system. And um, we don't have time. We do not have time to wait for another general election or wait for me to build a campaign. We're, we are already failing on, on our climate promises we've made. We are already acting too late. We are already talking, 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 instead of taking the straightforward action that, that could be made today. There are solutions we could be implementing today. And, you know, I, I spent a long time feeling drowned by, by climate anxiety and feeling completely powerless because I am 21, I don't have any political standing, yet it's my future that's on the line. And, and I'm not getting a say about it, but in non-violent civil resistance, people do have power. This is the only way that ordinary people can have an influence of power over the policies that are being made. And, and it is ordinary people that are being affected by the climate crisis today, even in this country. The cost of living crisis is part of the climate crisis. They are both one crisis, it is a crisis of greed, and people are suffering at the hands of the Tory party and the 1% who have always dictated the policies and the politics and non-violent civil resistance is where ordinary people have their power. Certainly a political future there, I think. Um, I'm going to, there's lots of hands up, so I'm going to take some more questions. Uh, there's a gentleman over there and a gentleman at the front here. Uh, I'll take a couple, and a lady in the middle there. If we take three, and I'm going to try and rattle through them. So two in the middle and one at the side. So go with you on the side first. Thank you all for your uh, contributions. Um, Just Stop Oil are campaigning because they don't feel like they're listened to. Um, Tom, you say we aren't doing enough on wind, solar, uh, nuclear, and to be fair, I agree with you. Um, but once, and you want to campaign for changes. Once you've done all of that campaigning, what are you going to do when you haven't been listened to either? Okay. <laughs> and the two questions in the middle here. Okay, thank you. Um, so just referring back to the question, is climate activism working? We heard a lot from the panelists about that we need, from all the panelists, I think, that we need to listen to the science. But what I'd be curious about, beyond historical analogies, such as the suffragettes, um, what does the behavioral and social science tell us that actually definitely works? Okay, and there was one more in the middle. 
Hello, so. thank you for the panel so far. Um, there's something about the framing. And so there's been, there was a question that was raised, what's going to be required from ordinary people? And there seems to be a big disjunct here from a deeper democracy of what, there's an assumption that ordinary people are going to resist the kind of changes that might be asked of them. But they're not actually being asked. There is, the climate is not being raised ever during an election. There's absolute silence. We know that we're on the precipice here, maybe even past the precipice. Why is this not a collective decision with everybody? OK, lovely. So, Tom, we're going to begin with you, and if you can briefly, because well, I want to get a few more in, yeah. answer sort of one and three. Uh, what if you're not listened to with your plea mm. for as much different forms of energy as possible? And also, is there an assumption that actually ordinary people will resist the kind of changes that, that may be required of them? We're not even asking. Well, the good news is, in countries without a mad system of planning, I am being listened to. Well, they're not listening to me, but they're listening to the market forces because developing countries are investing in renewables in a huge, huge way because they're cheaper in many senses than fossil fuels. In fact, the market is working tremendously when it comes particularly to solar power. And so the, the benefits are just so very obvious. And I think the biggest way that you win over hearts and minds and that, frankly, you carry the country with you in this pursuit is not by always saying, stop this, restrict that, reduce the way you live your lives. That does not encourage people to come with you. How about instead of saying, stop that, restrict that, turn that off, you think about how you deliver an age of energy abundance in a clean way. How do we constructively deliver the sort of capture storage of potentially carbon? How do we uh, deliver the clean energy in the United Kingdom, whether it's onshore wind, offshore wind, solar or nuclear power? And how do we get that built with the sort of consent that currently so is being denied, briefly. particularly, ironically, often by green campaigners. Tom, briefly then, are you suggesting that there aren't any trade-offs, there aren't going to be any difficult decisions for the ordinary public to make? Oh, no, I think there will be costs. Of course there'll be costs. Right, okay. but, I think, but I think the way that you can mitigate those costs in the biggest way possible is by delivering that agenda for energy abundance. Okay. Rupert, mm. feel free to address some of that, but I also yeah. want to ask you about um, this behavioural science. You know, yeah, that's what I was going to yeah, pick up. Yeah. Uh, so in the Climate Majority Project, we listen a, a lot to um, people like um, uh, Damon Centola and Erica Chenoweth who study these uh, things. And one of the things that, that they both say, uh, which um, has a lot of credibility behind it now, uh, is that to get transformative change in a society, uh, you need to get to a threshold of at least about 25% support now, that might not sound like much, it might sound like a minority, but of course it's actually you know, a very, very large number of people. Uh, in this country it would be something like 17 million or something like that. So that is a very clear indication of the kind of leverage and scale that we need if we're going to get the kind of transformation uh, that we need. Why 25%, by the way, I have a little pet theory on this I just want to share with you very briefly, which is that perhaps what it is, is that people sense when you reach that you've re a threshold of about 25% in terms of some big change that you're going to make, not something that can occur just through a viral tweet or something, something which is really substantial, going to change our lives. Perhaps people sense that you've now got a majority of the potential majority, right? That you're halfway to where you need to be in order to, for example, get something voted in. Anyway, whether that's true or not, we need to have millions of people on side with this. That's the key thing for my money that the behavioral and social science tells us. Okay, now. Can I answer? Of course. Uh, the lady's third question. I think you asked a very, very important question. Um, you say they haven't asked us. Um, they're never going to ask us. They're not going to ask us. They didn't ask the women uh, in late Victorian times, Georgian times, about whether they want the vote. They didn't ask. Do you, would you like to have the vote like everybody else? They're not going to ask you. It's, it's, it's just the way the 
landscape is when it comes to power and change. You have to compel it. We have to compel power by forcing this issue, making this issue an unavoidable fact of power itself before they will listen to us. They won't, listen, they won't come to us and say, what do you think? I love your glasses. What do you think about? They're not going to do that. We, all of us here and beyond, we have to compel them to listen to us. That is the power of the individual vote and voice, which we have to activate in ourselves and we have to spread and share amongst our neighbors and with our children and with our friends. I'm sorry, it is also partly our responsibility. A lot of people have been talking about what governments can do. Great, fine, excellent. But it is us, we, ordinary people, finally. We need to wake up to our own power and our own voice and make it the central issue of power itself. Would I be able to answer that? Very briefly. I'd like to get one more in. Go on. I'd, um, I'd just like to come on uh, what you said as well. Um, the, the, we do need social change, and people are going to have to make changes in their lifestyles, but when we're talking about it, I think it's important that we frame it in the context of what we risk losing. And if we do not see this social change, we are talking about the loss of the very fabric of our society, our food systems, the breakdown of law and order, losing our NHS, our economy, our pensions. We are talking about losing everything that we hold dear. And yeah, people are gonna have to make changes and make sacrifices. You know, I never thought that I'd sit here, age 21, and say, I've been arrested 11 times for the cause, and that I spent a month in prison last year. I never thought I'd be making peace with the fact that I might go back to prison. I've got three Crown Court cases against me. And, and I think it would be naive to say that that doesn't scare me. Of course, this isn't where I thought I'd be in my life right now. This isn't what I thought I'd have to be doing. But we have been forced into this position by the government because they are not taking the action that they should be taking on the climate crisis. And I am taking this action because I feel I have no other choice because my future is already on the line. But there will come a point in... 10 years' time, or 20 years' time, or 30 years' time, if we see the catastrophic effects of the climate crisis, where someone younger than you, someone you love, will ask you what you did when it counted. And, you'll and I don't you know how I would look that young person in the eyes or look myself in the mirror if I couldn't say I did everything non-violently in my power to stop this when it counted. Including campaigning against nuclear power. Yeah. Okay, we, I mean, well, come we've on. discussed that. I want to take one more question from the floor. Is there a question at the back? Because I feel like I ignored you. There's a lady on the left there in a striped T-shirt, and that's going to be the last one. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Tom, sorry to come back to you. Hello. Um, <laughs> there was a question, a, a point during the debate where you were talking about what would happen if people on the other side um, took action and were extremely kind of lying down in the streets, etc., on the same side. Um, and I think what we're ignoring in that is kind of the silent activism that's happening in terms of lobbying and the huge amount of power that happens behind closed doors that we don't see in the streets. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. Um, and so how can we bring more attention to the fact that that is happening and that we need to stop that through other means, such as through the climate majority work, um, to kind of shut that down? I have a statistic, sorry, it's from the US, but that in 2020, um, oil and gas um, spent $10 for every $1 that was spent for pro-climate campaigning in terms of lobbying. Um, and it's a massive problem that... <laughs> <laughs> sort of, I don't think we've addressed at all so far. Thank you. Tom, I'm very really, briefly, because we're nearly out. really sorry. I spent the whole of that trying to find where you were. I got, uh, ah, hello. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, th I think it is pertinent that you bring up this issue in the were, US. Were you going think... to take three questions and then... I'm, I'm going yeah, to have to wrap up. One. We're nearly, we're okay. nearly done. Sorry. No, I, th I think it is a much bigger problem in the US than it is in the UK, frankly. Um, but I also think that there is lobbying on all sides. We saw how Vladimir Putin lobbied to stop 
shale gas exploration in this country, which if we were using that instead of coal, for example, if we were using that instead of oil, we'd have lower emissions. There are ways in which we could have done this transition a decade ago that would have been better. Perhaps we're not in that place now, but I think there is lobbying going on in lots of ways, and we do need to be alive to that. But also, frankly, the forces, the market forces here are incredibly clear in terms of driving towards uh, clean power generation. What we really need, uh, number one, is planning reform to allow this stuff to get built. And what we really, really need is people who say they care so very much about reducing CO2 to not then campaign against things that might reduce our CO2. So I think, I think that that's something that would be really, really helpful. And if anyone here thinks that perhaps it's a good thing that we went through the Industrial Revolution and thinks that perhaps it's a good thing that's that we now have electricity and that it's a good thing that we can live into old age and that we can travel the world and we can see nature and we can go beyond our own little hamlets, I think that that's a good thing that we've achieved in the last 200 years. Mm -hmm. And we need to preserve that by creating more and more energy. And yes, we can do it in a clean way. So please don't campaign against new clean energy. Can I just I check, Tom, are you counting the £3.5 million that the Tory party took in legalised bribes from big polluters and climate deniers last year alone? Are you counting that as one of your democratic market forces? Do, do, you, think, do you think the Tory party... Sorry, is, is, is this the Conservative Party that is banning the internal combustion engine? Is this the Conservative Party that is banning gas boilers? Is this the Conservative Party that slaps taxes, green taxes, on energy bills? You think they're in the pocket of big oil? Really? OK. On that thought... <laughs> Legalised bribes that's readily available. There is another enormous conversation opening up there, and sadly, we know don't have time for it. Is the e Electoral Commission records just, if you do want to check it out afterwards? I, no, I'm going to draw a line under this. There is so much more to say, and I don't think uh, I'm, anyone's going to be satisfied at the end of it. Uh, it has been a brilliant conversation, though, and uh, brought up lots of thoughts for all of us. I think we will be thinking and discussing uh, this for some time to come. Thank you for all your questions in the hall and indeed online um, and thank you to our panel to Phoebe to Rupert to Ben to Tom uh, thank you to all of you for taking part there will be signing of books and the conversation can continue in the lobby I know there are lots of you that want to carry on this conversation do do stick around don't you don't have to say goodbye as soon as we finished but that's all from us here on the stage thank you very much for coming and joining tonight's discussion